Listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract one. Extract one, questions one to twelve. You hear a physician talking to a patient called Rasputin. For questions one to twelve, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. Extract two. Good morning. Please take a seat. Tell me about your problem. Good morning, doctor. I currently work as a phlebotomist and respiratory therapist in a hospital. When I was attempting to do a blood gas, I had my left hand finger over the pulse, and I was inserting the contaminated needle using my right hand. I was wearing protective clothing and gloves. As I advanced the contaminated needle, I jerked away. Causing me to pull out of the arm and accidentally pricked of my index finger, I was seen and evaluated at the emergency ward immediately. In the diagnosis, I was found to be a carrier for hepatitis C and negative for HIV. I had a periodic screening, including blood tests. I completed a three-shot series for hepatitis B and had titers drawn that shows protected antibodies. I am up to date on my immunization, including tetanus. What's your age? Thirty-six, doctor. What medications are you taking? Nexium. Any previous medical history or surgeries? I had degenerative disc disease in my back. Are you allergic to any medications? I am allergic to IV contrast. Are you continuing your work? Yes, doctor. Well, your temperature is ninety-seven point two degrees. Pulse rate is eighty-four. Respirations fourteen and unlabored, and blood pressure one o two over seventy. You are negative for HIV. You have no other symptoms suggesting acute hepatitis. Your liver function test is normal at eighteen, and you have no signs of infection. You have developed acute intestinal illness due to blood-borne pathogen exposure secondary to contaminated needle stick. Continue with Nexium twenty milligrams a day until the condition improves. Otherwise, you are medically fit and no need for further diagnosis or treatment. Thank you, doctor. Extract two, questions thirteen to twenty-four. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Mrs. Melissa. For questions thirteen to twenty-four, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes.
Good morning, doctor. Good morning. Please be seated. May I ask why you have come to see me? Well, I have had a sudden onset of pain by lifting a weight of about 40 pounds at my workplace. I have developed pain on my left hip. Although the pain is dull, it is aching and stabbing. The severity ranges from mild to severe. The pain is present constantly and worsens while sitting, twisting, lifting, or riding in a car. The pain improves after resting. Sleep alteration due to pain is positive and I wake up after getting to sleep. I am feeling depressed all the time due to this persistent pain and have lost my interest in all activities. I get insomnia, lack of concentration, fatigue, and loss of energy. Do you have pain on your spine? Yes, doctor. Your age? 48, doctor. Are you attending your work? No, doctor. I am not going to work. Have you been immunized before? Yes, doctor. I had flu vaccine two years ago and pneumonia vaccine five years ago. Do any of your family members have a history of illness? My father is 79 and had a cerebrovascular stroke and hypertension. My mother had a congestive history of heart failure and died at the age of 70. Tell me if you have any past medical history? I had an appendectomy seven years ago and a cholecystectomy three years ago. Do you drink or smoke? I used to smoke before, but I have stopped smoking nowadays, and I drink socially. What medications are you taking now? I am taking Lortab 10 milligrams whenever I get pain. Are you allergic to any medication? No, doctor. Well, your MRI shows small central herniated nucleus pulposus at L4-5, bulge at L3-4. There is a shallow left parasag, herniated nucleus pulposus at L5-S1. There is an entrapment of the superior gluteal nerve in the aponeurosis of the gluteus medius left, and you are also suffering with depression and sleep disorder. So I would recommend you take a treatment for superior gluteal nerve block left. I am going to prescribe you baclofen 10 mg before bedtime, flurbiprofen 100 mg twice a day, hydrochlorothiazide 25 mg once in a day, and colonopin 0.5 mg before bedtime. Continue these medications for three weeks and meet me thereafter for a scheduled follow-up for medical management and re-evaluation of your condition. Depending on your condition after three weeks, I will decide if any diagnostic or therapeutic intervention is required or not. Okay, thank you, doctor. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at the question 25. You hear a monologue by a physician explaining to his staff about cutaneous manifestations. Now read the question. Cutaneous manifestations are the medical consequences of starvation, vomiting, abuse of drugs such as diuretics and laxatives, and of psychiatric morbidity. These manifestations include lanugo-like body hair, cirrhosis, carotenoderma, telogen effluvium, acne, 
seborrheic dermatitis, hyperpigmentation, acrocyanosis, petechiae, pernosis, livido reticularis, interdigital intertrigo, peronychia, generalized pruritus, acquired sture distente, slower wound healing, purigo pigmentosa, edema, linear arrhythmia, creleke, acral coldness, pellagra, scurvy, and acrodermatitis enteropathica. The most characteristic cutaneous sign of vomiting is knuckle calluses called Russell's sign. Symptoms arising from laxative or diuretic abuse include adverse reactions to drugs. Symptoms arising from psychiatric morbidity include the consequences of self-induced trauma. Question 26. You hear a monologue by a physician explaining to his staff about symptoms of anorexia nervosa. Now read the question. Multiple studies of anorexia nervosa patients have revealed a decreased left ventricular mass, cardiac output, left ventricular index, and left ventricular diastolic and systolic dimensions. Long-standing hypovolemia has also been seen in the patients. Mitral valve motion abnormalities, including mitral valve prolapse, were also seen in a distinct minority that can cause chest pain and palpitations but the ejection fraction seems to remain preserved in most patients. However, weight restoration had a significant impact in normalization of cardiac dimensions. Question 27. You hear a discussion between a physician and his nurse about endometriosis. Now read the question. Hello doctor, what is endometriosis? Well, endometriosis is a disorder when the tissue that forms the lining of uterus grows outside of the uterine cavity. It is abnormal for endometrial tissue to spread beyond the pelvic region. This condition is known as an endometrial implant. The hormonal changes of the menstrual cycle impact the displaced endometrial tissue causing the region to become painful, inflamed, and making the tissue grow thicker and finally break down. At one stage, the broken tissue has nowhere to go and becomes trapped in the pelvis. Question 28. You hear a discussion between the physician and his nurse about treating the signs of eating disorders. Now read the question. Hello doctor, what kinds of treatment measures do you suggest for the signs caused due to eating disorders? Although skin signs of the patients with eating disorders improve as they gain weight, the dermatologist is responsible to treat the dermatological conditions as well. Antibacterials or azelaic acid is effective to treat acne that these may be described as monotherapy or in combinations. 
Combination zinc with antibacterials such as ethromycin are also suggested because zinc deficiency can be a possible cause for this sign. Angular stomatitis, sheolitis, and nail fragility can be treated with topical tocopherol. Cirrhosis improves with moisturizing ointments. Ointments that contain urea are effective in decreasing the size of Russell's sign. Question 29. You hear a discussion between a physician and his junior about pain transmission. Now read the question. Hello doctor, what is the theory of pain transmission? Well, the nerve fibers that are connected to the receptors in the skin, muscles, and organs called primary afferent axons transmits the pain signals to the brain and spinal cord. These axons of various sizes may be myelinated or unmyelinated that are classified into different groups based on their size, namely A alpha, A beta, A delta, and C nerve fibers. All of the A afferent axons fibers are myelinated, while C afferent axons fibers are unmyelinated. The thickness of a fiber determines the speedy transmission of information. According to the gate control theory of pain, the pain is a function to balance between the information traveling into the spinal cord through large and small nerve fibers. Small nerve fibers transmit non-susceptive information of the pain whereas large nerve fibers carry non-nociceptive information. The large and small axon nerve fibers synapse on projection neuron cells to the brain and on inhibitory interneurons within the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. The firing of the projection neuron signals pain to the brain. The inhibitory interneuron decreases the chances of the firing of the projection neuron. Question 30. You hear a discussion between a physician and his nurse about subclinical seizures. Now read the question. Hello doctor, when do subclinical seizures occur? Well, subclinical seizures occur due to unusual electrical activity within the brain. Often, the symptoms are unnoticed, even by the patient. The only method to detect subclinical seizures is performing an electroencephalogram to measure the electrical activity of the brain. That can capture the seizure activity. At times, subclinical seizures are mistaken for the abnormal behavior of autistic patients. For instance, an autistic student showed good cognitive development in his studies last year. However, this year his progress has slowed down. Signs such as aggression or meltdowns were seen in the patient. He used to daydream and ignore others when anyone asked him anything. This condition was mistaken by his parents for autism. All such signs are often mistaken for behavioral issues linked with autism that can actually be connected with a subclinical seizure. According to findings, subclinical seizures may be the cause of psychiatric disorders or compulsive and behavioral disorders or even schizophrenic, criminal, and antisocial activities.
That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at Extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear the doctor briefing his staff about guidelines for the early detection of cancer. You have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Guidelines for the Early Detection of Cancer I am going to explain to you the guidelines for screening different types of cancers. These screening tests are suggested to detect cancer before the patient develops any symptoms. Colon and rectal cancer and polyps Starting regular screening at the age of 45 is suggested for people at average risk of colorectal cancer. The screening can be performed either with a sensitive test that examines for cancer signs in the stool of the person or with an exam to look at the colon and rectum. This can be done either with a sensitive test that looks for signs of cancer in a person's stool or with an exam that looks at the colon and rectum. If the person is maintaining a good health, he should continue with regular screening through to the age of 75. For people aged 76 to 85, they should confirm with the physician whether continuing with the screening is right or not. People above 85 should no longer get colorectal cancer screenings. If the person wishes to be screened with a test other than a colonoscopy, any abnormal result should be followed up with a colonoscopy. Cervical cancer. Cervical cancer screening should begin at age 21. However, women below 21 years should not be screened. Women between 21 to 29 should have a pap screening done once in every three years. However, HPV screening should not be performed for this age group unless it is required after an abnormal pap test result. Women between 30 to 65 should have a pap test in addition to HPV test termed as co-testing done every five years. This is the most suggested approach. However, having a pap test alone is also okay for this age group. Women above 65 who have had regular cervical cancer screening for the past 10 years with normal results should not be tested for cervical cancer. Once screening is discontinued, it should not be started again. Women with a history of severe cervical precancer should continue screening for at least 20 years after that diagnosis, even if testing goes past age 65. 
The women whose uterus and cervix have been removed, total hysterectomy, for reasons not related to cervical cancer and without any cervical cancer history or severe precancer should not be screened. Women vaccinated against HPV should still follow the screening recommendations for their age groups. Women with a history of HIV infection, organ transplant, DES exposure, etc. may require a different screening schedule for cervical cancer. Breast cancer. Women from 40 to 44 should have the choice to start annual breast cancer screening with mammograms. Women from 45 to 54 should get yearly mammograms. Women above 55 may get mammograms once in every two years. Screening should continue as long as a woman is in good health and is expected to live more than 10 years. Women should be well informed with the known benefits, potential harms, and limitations linked to breast cancer screening. Certain women with a genetic tendency family history, or certain other factors should get screened with MRIs along with mammograms. Endometrial Cancer I would recommend that during menopause, every woman should be informed about the risks and symptoms of endometrial cancer. Certain women with a disease history may need to opt for a yearly endometrial biopsy. Lung Cancer I would recommend yearly lung cancer screening with a low-dose CT scan for certain people prone to lung cancer who meet the following criteria. Aged between 55 to 74 years and maintaining good health. And stopped smoking in the past 15 years. And having a minimum of 30 packs per year smoking history. Prostate cancer. I would recommend that men make an informed decision after consulting with a physician whether to be screened for prostate cancer. Research has not yet proven that the benefits of screening outweigh the harms of testing and treatment. Therefore, I believe that men should not be screened without understanding about the risk factors and benefits of screening and treatment. Starting from the age of 50, men should consult a physician about the risk factors and benefits of screening so that they can decide if screening is right for them or not. If they are African American or have a father or brother who had prostate cancer before the age of 65, one should consult a physician right from the age of 45. If one decides to be screened, he should get a prostate-specific antigen blood test with or without a rectal exam. How often he will be tested will depend on his prostate-specific antigen level. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear the doctor giving a lecture on the effect of disrupting gut-brain communication. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
According to research findings, disrupting gut-brain communication may affect memory and learning abilities. The link between memory and food is a fundamental human experience that we all can relate to. However, the findings have unveiled an intriguing explanation behind this phenomenon, illustrating how strongly the second brain in our gut communicates with our brain. A massive mesh of neurons termed as second brain lies inside our gastrointestinal tract. While this neuronal control system primarily functions independently to manage our digestive system, the study reveals that this neuronal control system communicates with the brain directly through a long nerve called the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve mediates a great deal of metabolic communication between the gut and the brain. For instance, the study revealed how feeding behavior initiated by hippocampus activity is directly activated by vagal nerve stimulation, mediated by signals from the gastrointestinal tract. It appears obvious that signals from the gut would be communicating with the brain in this way, allowing us to know when we should stop eating. But what if these gut to hippocampus communications covered satiety clues or more than simple hunger? Could they also impact cognitive and other memory processes regulated by the hippocampus? A study conducted to on this topic that utilized a novel rodent model that terminates about 80% of gut to hippocampus communicators while still retaining fundamental brain to gut motor signaling. The study revealed that when this gut brain pathway was detached, the rats displayed impaired episodic and spatial working memory. That means the rats could not effectively generate and access spatial memories provoked by the gastrointestinal system. With this disrupted pathway, a fascinating link between our gut and memory is hypothesized. When rats locate and eat a meal, the vagus nerve is activated and this global positioning system is engaged. Therefore, it would be advantageous for an animal to remember their external environment to locate the food again. The artificial electrical stimulation of the vagus nerve can increase memory function. However, this is the first study to find an endogenous connection from the gut through to the hippocampus that mediates this cognitive pathway. Interestingly, this study revealed that the specific vagal nerve disruption studied here did not affect social learning, body weight, or anxiety. The study concluded by raising a concern over the lack of research in this subject. It is recommended that common bariatric surgeries, such as a gastric bypass, have been found to reduce the effectiveness of vagal nerve signaling to the hippocampus. Moreover, a recently approved FDA obesity treatment called V-block therapy has been effective in weight loss by electrically disrupting the vagus nerve. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.
That is the end of the listening test.